This week's Parsha, friends, as we are all aware, is the story of the great deluge, the great flood, after which we read. that Noach and his family leave the ark. They actually were commanded to leave the ark, which is strange. you think they would be um, pounding at the door, which reminds me, <laughs> many years ago when we went to visit my parents in Australia with our children who were, Baruch Hashem, uh, all young, Tommy got back to Montreal. They were literally pounding at the door to get off the plane. So you think no, it would be the same. Why would God have to command him to leave? And the answer is because Noah's Ark was not quite like our flight. It was a foretaste of the Messianic era, no less. Witness, the wolf lies down with the lamb in close quarters, all of these animals and creatures, which are mortal, naturally mortal enemies, <clears throat> lived in peace and harmony for the entire year. And it was in fact, uh, a revelation of the divine akin to when Mashiach will come. No wonder Noach was reluctant to leave. But leave he must. And when he did, <clears throat> he considered his new mission to recultivate the devastated earth and became immediately a, a farm laborer. What does he plan, tells us the Torah? We had taken vine branches into the ark as well as all kinds of seeds and began by planting a vineyard. Our sages are somewhat critical of that. Uh, one would think that one should first plant the staples, but we can understand Nayakh. He wants to celebrate, toast a whole brave new world, and so he plants a vineyard. I may have shared this with you before, it's worth repeating. Not just for the listener, but for the speaker. So as he was about to plant the vineyard, our sages tell us this is all symbolic, but Satan appeared. I stress symbolic because we don't believe in a Satan as he may be conjuring the image in your mind. Um, as we are strongly influenced in West, the Western world by uh, Christian distortion. Um, no, there is no anti-God Satan, although there is a Satan, but not the Christian Satan. So this is the real Satan. So he appears and it's largely symbolic. It's the evil incarnation within. And Satan says to Noach, would you like me to be a partner with you in making the vine grow? Oh, for sure. Responded Noach. So, Satan, let's call him Satan. He leaves and returns a little lamb in his arm, which he proceeds then to slaughter and pour the blood over the vine. Hmm. Then he comes back a second time with a lion, does the same. Third time with a monkey, does the same. And finally with, you may have guessed it, a pig. In the story. The message, a graphic description of um, excess drinking. First we become docile and like the lamb. First cup, symbolically. The second one, like the lion, strongly opinionated and uh, aggressively expressive. Third cup, fool like the monkey. And finally, uh, like the pig, who uh, rolls in the mud in the woods of our sages in one's own vomit, a very graphic description of the, the net result. So it's a strong warning about the excesses of alcohol. But Noach is anxious and uh, our sages say, actually, he underestimated himself. He thought he could handle his drink, but didn't. I guess that's been the uh, pretty much the model for all men thereafter. So he drinks and becomes quickly intoxicated. Very strong wine and all of this fertilizer 
I contributed to its tox toxicity. So there he is, um, intoxicated, lying in the tent, disgraced, naked, no less. Torah tells us that one of his grandsons, Canaan, Canaan, sees his grandfather lying drunk and exposed. He tells his father, Cham. Now has three sons, Shem, Cham, and Yafes. So our sages say he looks at his father and he proceeds to castrate him. Why would he do that? Two reasons. Number one, there are three sons. He wants to have a fourth. That will just diminish our, my portion of the world, not willing to share it with anybody else. Furthermore, he argued, Adam had two sons and they killed each other. One killed the other. He's got three and he wants a fourth, enough. And that's why he castrated him. And some say he sodomized him, uh, which means he did both. The other brothers, Yefes and Shame, are enraged at their brother's conduct. And they walk in backwards. They do not see their father's nakedness and they holding a blanket over their shoulders, they drop it over him and cover him. When he awakens, he realizes what has happened. Of course, he's been castrated and he's probably terribly bruised. So he knew what Cham had done. How did he know? Just looking at Cham's eyes. How did he know what Shem and Yefes had done? Probably just looking at them. I'm just going to continue the story here because it's fascinating. And he repays his sons measure for measure. So shame and Yefes covered him. So shame, that's us. We're called Semites friends because we are descendants of shame. Sem. So we're called Semites. So we got the mitzvah of what? The tzitzis, the talus. Which, by the way, the custom is that the, the, the kala, when a couple become engaged, before the wedding, she gives him the talus. So we got that talus, descendants of shame, Shem, for covering Noyach. The sons of Yefes, what's their reward? They get an honorable burial at the end of days. Without going to the whole story of Gog and Magog, but they're descendants of Yefes. And in the end, they are given a place fit for burial, says the prophet Ezekiel which is also an honor. Cham, God said, you despised your father and therefore you'll be paid back in equal terms. And so when Egypt is conquered by the king of Assyria, Egypt is a descendant of Cham. And the king of Assyria conquers Egypt and Ethiopia, both Cham's descendants. So the prophet describes how they're taken into exile, young and old, naked and barefoot, with buttocks uncovered to the shame of Egypt. He had disgraced his father, his children, descendants would be disgraced. Moreover, as you all know, Noyach curses Cham. He said, you stop me from having a fourth son so your fourth son will be cursed. And that was Canaan. And as you know, he was cursed that they would be slaves and serve his brothers. I'll conclude this with a fascinating uh, account related in the Talmud. In the time of Alexander the Great, so the Africans accused the Jews of the following. The land of Israel belongs to us. In fact, it's called Canaan. They were descendants of Canaan. And they took it. it. Belongs to us. 
So Alexander says to the Jews, answer them. It's a fair charge. Land of Canaan. So there was a Jewish fellow called Gavia ben Pesisa, if I'm not mistaken, he was a hunchback. So he volunteered to defend the Jews. And he said to the sages, let, let me go. He said, if, they, if the other party, if I win, is good. And if they win, then we'll, at least our, our, our respect will be intact, our honor, because we, the Jews can say, well, we were just offended by an ordinary fellow. So the sages said, okay. So uh, Gavi appears in, in Alexander the Great's court and he says, on what claim? On what is your claim based? And he said, on scripture. The land of Canaan belongs to the descendants of Canaan. If so, said Gavia, I will disprove you from scripture. Noyach said that Canaan be a slave to his brothers. And you tell me, whatever a slave owns, to whom does it belong? To the master. So in fact, not only does the land of Canaan belong to us, all your possessions do as well. Alexander turns to the Africans and says, answer his rebuttal. Give us three days, they said to Alexander. They could find no valid counter argument from scripture and fled. Talmud concludes that it was a particularly difficult year for the Jewish people because it was a Shemitah year, the fields were bare. And because they had forsaken their own property, the Jews were able to gather in their harvest, not of, not of Israel, and benefited greatly from the African crops that year. An amazing story, um, the conclusion of, of the consequence, one of the consequences of of uh, Noach's curse. With respect to shame, that's us, or Shem, Noach blessed them and he said, blessed be the God of shame, the Shechina will appear amongst shame's descendants, the children of Israel. As for Yefes, the founder of Persia and Greece, he blessed them as well. And in fact, it was the Persian king Cyrus, Koresh, and Hebrew. They built the second temple, but the Shechina only resided in the first built by Shlomo King Solomon. That's pretty much the story. Now we're going to zero in on the detail we have spoken about in the past, but it's so timely and such an important message that it's worth repeating and God willing with, with more insight than we have shared in the past. Is that okay? Okay. So you heard the story. The story is that that uh, the Torah is like this. After Chom did what he did and boasts about it to his brothers, to shame in Yefes, the old fool, he said, I fixed him for good. So they, the Torah says, quote, they walk in backwards, holding the cloak over their shoulders, and the nakedness of their father they did not see. So the question is, well, if you're walking backwards, obviously you're not going to see your father's nakedness. That was the whole objective. So why does the Torah have to add the patently obvious that they didn't see their father's nakedness? That's the whole point of them walking in backwards. Before I go into detail and explain the answer, already there's a profound message here in where we should be looking. Or not looking. Tznius, we all know that Tznius means, on its literal, most basic level, that the body is covered. But it goes beyond us covering our own body. Tznius also means where we should be looking at somebody else. I don't just mean this physically either. By that I mean nobody's perfect, no body is perfect, no personality is perfect talking about spouses specifically, but in general, when I say bodies, I mean spouses. When I'm talking about personality, I'm talking about all of our relationships, the point being, sneeze means, modesty means, don't look where you're not invited. If somebody has a flaw, we should endeavor not to look at it. If it's physical or emotional or intellectual, that's true sneeze. That's true being modest. Choosing where 
to fix our gaze or not. That needs to be elaborated upon, but that's really part of our subject today. That's the truth. But that's the first basic message here is, quite literally, and I'm talking about physical looking, uh, to be discriminate where we look and not look where um, at, at somebody else's uh, exposed shame and failure. This, by the way, in addition to another similar lesson about speech, very powerful uh, message. Early on in the same parsha, the Torah, uh, God commands Noach to bring in the animals into the ark. So he's told like this, the animals which are pure or kosher, you bring in seven pairs, and the animals which are not, one. Now, the way the Hebrew is framed, the way God spoke to Noach was in Hebrew, he said, the animal which is not pure, which raises the obvious question, just spell it out, impure, tome, it's a simple Hebrew word that has three letters. Why this backwards way of saying it? An animal which is not pure, you bring in only one couple. Bring in, say, Tome, and finished. So from here we learn that a person has to be careful with his language and never use direct uh, derogatory language, even if it's true and necessary. If you can say the same thing in a more refined way, an indirect way. Incredible lesson. Rebbe would never use the word bad. He would say not good. If you use the word ugly, you would say not beautiful, and so on. So we get these powerful uh, lessons here, which we only to be reminded of in terms of speech and sight. That we should be discriminate and careful and refined and endeavor to speak in a refined way and to, to only look um, where invited. So back to the, to the story and the details here. So why is the Torah repeating or saying the obvious that they didn't see their father's nakedness when it's obvious in the narrative itself? The whole reason they walk in backwards is because they don't want to see him. You don't have to state that it's obvious. The answer is the Torah is not stating the obvious. The Torah is saying two things. Number one, they walked in backwards. They physically didn't see their father's nakedness. Then when the Torah adds and says, they didn't see their father's nakedness. That's meant psychologically and spiritually. Let me explain. The Baal Shem Tov said, famous teaching in the Baal Shem Tov, everything is divine providence. Nothing happens by accident. He said, if I see a flaw, a sin, a failure in somebody else, it means I have it. It's a message to me. I'm looking into a mirror. What's that teaching based on? Because God observes his own laws. He tells us not to speak lush and harder, which means gossip, expose, talk about somebody else's failings. So if God arranged the world such that I'm seeing somebody else's failing, then he's speaking lush and harder. Why would God let me see that? The answer is, mm -hmm. it isn't about the other person. It's about you, about me. Because I have failed to rectify the problem in myself, because of my self-love, my ego, delusion, we're afraid to see our own failings. Because we're afraid that we're going to conclude that we are useless and worthless. And that's a terrifying thought. What we fail to realize is that we can have a failing, but we can fix it and do tshuva. But that's hard work. Who wants to work hard? So we just don't look there. 
and be in blissful ignorance. Hashem sees we're not, uh, we're stuck. Says the Barshem Tov, so he makes us see that failing in somebody else. And the Barshem Tov declares unequivocally, you see a failing in another person, it's a divine message for yourself. Go home and look deeply, well, not so deeply, it may not be so deep, and find that failing, that very shortcoming. Reminds me of a little Hasidic story. I forgot with whom it was. Anyway, there was a, a fella that was very critical of everybody and everything, and always finding fault. So his fellow, his colleague, the Hasid, said to him, you know where you're always finding fault? It's like someone walks around and he says, you know, it smells. Everywhere he goes, it smells. Terrible odor. They pointed out to him because right under your nose, you know, on your mouth, top of your mouth, is a piece of tinnuf of excrement. And that's what you're smelling wherever you go. You're smelling yourself. Similar idea. Clean yourself up and you'll find your environment is not so terrible. In fact, it may be beautiful and, uh, and full of, uh, of, of delicious and uh, aroma. So that's what Bar Shem Tev taught. Bar Shem Tev taught that when you see a failing in the other persons by divine providence, God would not have allowed you to see it because he doesn't speak Lashonara unless it's the only way to get through dull-witted me, dull-witted in the sense of my refusal to acknowledge my own failings, and he makes me see it in somebody else, and it should be, said the Baal Shem Tev. Whoa, a red flag. Stop in your tracks. Dead halt. This is me I'm looking at. Famous sobering teaching of the Baal Shem Tev, which we could stop right here, and that would be enough. But the Rebbe goes further. The Rebbe says, whoa, wait a minute. Who says I have the problem? You're saying it's Ashgach Pratis, divine providence. And God would not allow me to see somebody else's failing unless I have it. But there's another possibility. And the possibility is maybe I'm seeing the failing in somebody else because I have to fix it in them. Maybe that's the reason. Are we not responsible for each other? We are. Call you Salat even Zubuzu. All Jews are responsible for each other. So why does the Hashem insist that if you see a failing in somebody else, it means I have it. Maybe I'm seeing it because I should be helping them. That's all. So the answer is, well, in theory, that's true. But here is the litmus test to see, to determine, to conclude what my course of action should be. Is it about fixing me and not them? Or is it about me fixing them? How do I know why I'm seeing this? In a very simple and uh, direct measure, yardstick by which we can measure and, and decide my personal course of action that is seen or heard, for that matter, even heard about somebody else's failing. Here's the litmus test. What's the initial reaction? What's my initial reaction? If my initial reaction is, that's disgusting. How horrible. Then it means I have the same problem. May not be as overt, as obvious, but I have the same problem. And the reason I'm seeing it or hearing it is for me to fix it within me. And that's what the Bosh Tov said. If you see the failing, and that's what your gaze is fixed on, you're looking at the failing, at the ugly, exposed shortcoming. 
That's what's occupying my attention. Said the Bashem unequivocally, Mister, this is about you. This is a mirror. Forget this other person. However, if my reaction is, Oy vey gewalt, Rahman is terrible, how can I help? If it's compassion, if the initial response is, what can I do to, to solve this problem? How can I fix it? How can I help? Whether it's, whether, whether we're talking about, mind you, an individual or a problem with the malaise in the world, what, what, what's my reaction? What's what, what I want to do now? I want to, I want to help. Then help. That's why you saw it. That's why you saw it. In fact, do so. And that's the meaning of the story. The Torah says they walked in backwards. Physically, they didn't see their father's nakedness. And then the Torah adds, and they didn't, then it adds the word. It says these words, they walked in backwards. Then it adds, and they didn't see this far, this nakedness means that's not what preoccupied them. Unlike Chom, all he sees is his foolish old man disgracing himself. This did not occur to them. All they thought was givald, we have to fix this. How do we, how do we rectify how do, we, how do we restore his dignity and honor? That's the whole preoccupation. That's the reaction. They did not see, mean they didn't fixate on it. That's not what garnered their attention. So they were in a, in a position therefore to help, and they did, and they were blessed, and as you heard, blessed unto all generations till Mashiach comes. So this, friends, we're left with this very, very powerful message. The message goes beyond, you know, how am I hearing this ill report or seeing this, uh, this failure? It's more than that. It, we need to train ourselves. It starts through training, behavioral therapy. We need to train ourselves, even though the reality is for many of us, I won't speak for all of you, or even most of you, some of us, I'll speak for myself. The reaction would be disgusting. Of course, it all depends, obviously, I might add this as well. It depends also, you know, um, if we're hearing about something that is uh, unrelated to me and not a competition to me in my life, then I'm more inclined to Oh, how terrible, tusk, tusk. But if it's someone that's somehow a competition to me, my place, my honor, my influence, whatever it is, then the, the ego reaction to, aha, caught you, uh, is going to be uh, more natural, more natural to the Yetzirah and the animal soul. Because we become more defensive then. And we gloat more when someone that or we've had some run in with them in the past, and we have some uh, some kind of uh, uh, what's what I'm looking for. We have uh, a vendetta that we're not letting go of because we can't let go of it because we're too petty and selfish. <clears throat> and we refuse to recognize that God bonds the world and it's all meant to be. And we hang on to grievances for weeks and months and years and decades. So with that person we see exposed, oh, we're thrilled. So we need to train ourselves to get over ourselves a little bit and not to gloat and not to focus and to just turn our attention elsewhere. And if our reaction is one of compassion, not of a glee or holier than thou, then by God help this person. That's why you heard about it. Get involved. Fix this problem, whether it's an individual or it's a, a global problem, whatever the case may be, then it's, then it's a divine call, divine message to, uh, 
to help. So again, so we, in conclusion, you know, this is a litmus test for where we're holding. We know where we're holding. The big, the more important message is to train ourselves, to train ourselves to be sneers <clears throat> as we began that discussion, <clears throat> to be modest, not just dressing modest ourselves, but to be sneers, not to look where it is a person is ashamed. Just heard a story yesterday. I'll share it with you. A story related by my label, Grown the Love of Shalom. One of the Rebbe's longtime secretaries who uh, sadly had one of the early uh, succumbed to, to COVID 19 and it first uh, hit. So he tells, uh, he tells a story as follows. It's a rather long story, but the bottom, the bottom line is of a yeshiva boy who was expected to be where he should be, and he wasn't there, and the Rebbe noticed, and the Rebbe inquired as to what had happened, and Rabbi Grona had suggested to the Rebbe that he would speak to the boy, and the Rebbe said, absolutely not, because if he, you do, he knows that he will presume it came from me, and he will be embarrassed. And therefore don't say anything. Even though it was a, uh, he should have been there and so on, but there must be some other way to get the message, not coming in such a way that he knows that the Rebbe had noticed and the Rebbe had commented. Because that would embarrass him. And a final story. I've told before in a beautiful story that I heard from Rabbi Manus Friedman, who was a witness to this. It was one Shabbos, so he's uh, talking about not embarrassing somebody. So he uh, is walking up Kingston Avenue, and uh, I think he was walking with Rabbi Dvorkin, who was the accompanying him, perhaps, or certainly walking with an earshot. Rabbi Dvorkin was the Rav. The, the rabbinical authority in Crown Heights, the Rebbe's Rav, Rabbi. And a fellow approaches him, a young fellow on the street, Rabbi, and a question. And it was some question in the laws of Shabbos, something that he, to which Rabbi Dvorkin responded, and he was with his wife, he was with his wife, this young, newly married couple. Rabbi Dvorkin responded, I'll get back to you, uh, uh, later, tomorrow, okay, with the answer to your question, what's the ruling in this case, something, it, either was a, a laws of Shabbos question or the laws of Kashrus. So when, when the couple had, had uh, continued their walk, Rabbi Friedman, a Bacha Yeshiva student in Asabe Dvarkin, it was a very simple question, a very simple answer. It was a clear cut, black and white, um, response. Well, why did, what is the rabbi seeing in this that he needs to consult the sources and get back to the young man? To which Rabbi Dvorkin responded, he said, if I would have answered right away, I would have embarrassed him in front of his wife. That a simple question he didn't know the answer to. A simple law he was unaware of. That's why he said, I'll get back to him. Incredible sensitivity. not to embarrass so this is you know a teaching we've talked about and as i started as i mentioned as we began this it's something we need to hear again and again and again because this is the perennial struggle the struggle is with our own uh, delicate little ego i say it's little because it's really not the things we are concerned with are really not significant for the most part and to train ourselves, to train ourselves, at least in the behavioral level, to control our speech, where we look, where we gaze, where we focus our attention, and to try and be as much as possible positive and, and uh, proactive, responding 
in affirmative ways, in ways that will solve situations, uh, help situations, and not uh, uh, gloat or delight in them, as it boosts our own ego. All right, strong message today. Um, hope everybody enjoyed it. And most importantly, we take it to heart. As good as we all are, we can all improve in this area.